A little paranoia among friends is probably my favorite episode of the bunch because it turns Bert into a government agent. The people of Toluca, New Mexico think that they have an alien problem and that their loved ones are being abducted. However, the real reason is much more grounded and believable. It's a graboid. Bert and Tyler are tasked with going to the town and helping out. Except the citizens there don't want help. They all believe the alien story and, furthermore, think that their loved ones will return once the ETs are done with them. Bert meets with the locals and basically becomes enemies with the whole town. You're all nuts. Yelling at them for being so stupid to believe in UFOs and little green men. But they know the truth. The government sent Bert to cover it all up. It's funny seeing the shoe on the other foot and meeting a whole town that's more of a conspiracy nut than Bert. Oh, the government plant. I beg your pardon. Telling all this information to the townsfolk is Cecil Carr, who hosts a radio program everyone listens to. His wife is one of the ones missing, and it all seems to stem from a satellite dish. This dish is planted to try to attract the aliens, but it has a side effect. Its vibrations also attract a graboid. But of course, only Bert and Tyler know the truth. For now. The town retaliates on their new guests, taking out Bert's seismos and slashing his tires on his beloved power wagon. In the end, Tyler has to make up a story about how they're the ones that are right. Him and Bert are the government agents in charge of the cover-up, and the evil alien is actually a graboid. The locals accept this and join our heroes in fighting the giant monster. They all go to the satellite dish where Cecil's already at, preparing for what he thinks is the alien's return. Because the town destroyed Bert's seismos, he needs an accurate reading on where the graboid is. He calls over to Rosalita to go to his house and read his equipment. But in order to get in, she has to say the magic word. Heather. A nice little callback to Reba. Anyway, they pinpoint the graboid and the worm attacks. But our guys are prepared and they manage to take out the giant beast. Back in town, everyone thanks the duo, and Bert is forced to say this. I'm just a government man doing his job for the taxpayers. The best part of the episode, besides Bert being a government agent, is this guy, who just wants to eat his food, but every time he goes for a bite, the guys come in and interrupt. Hey, I've been in here three times and I still haven't had a meal. Flora or Fauna brings back the Mixmaster plotline. Some guys are out studying, because apparently perfection is the only place in the world scientific research can be done. Well, they're all out there working and they get sprayed with some acid and instantly turn to a skeleton. In town, we meet a new reoccurring character, Larry Norville, played by J.D. Walsh. He's an uber nerd who only wants to have a sighting of El Blanco. So he books Tyler's tour and heads out. But unfortunately, no graboids. Instead, they find Bert out picking berries. And then suddenly, their seismographs start going off. El Blanco is close by, but someone else is making these vibrations. They make Larry stay back, and Tyler and Bert go to check it out. When they get there, they spot the researcher's main base, led by Dr. Casey Matthews. Her and her team are out here studying the soil, looking for the effects of Mixmaster on the local ecosystem. And this time, they seem to know what they're doing, installing a three-inch solid steel graboid barrier wherever they walk. Well, not hearing anything from their field agents for a while, Tyler and Casey head out to find him. And, well, they do, at least what's left of them. The scientists look into it, and they're going to need some help. So, Kalidas shows up to lend a hand. The next day, they go out to dig part of it up and figure out that its root system is huge. Pumpkin patch from hell. They bring a sample of it back to study it further, and here we learn that it is indeed infected by Mixmaster. 
this time combining both plant and animal DNA, making this creature both flora or fauna, with the ability to spit out acid and grow to gigantic sizes. While most of the crew go to get a rough idea how big this thing is, Casey's assistant, Roger, stays back with the sample, and he doesn't notice that it's growing right behind him. The others return to the lab to see the now basketball-sized plant monster. Worse yet, it spreads seeds. Uh, yeah, good idea. Just stand there looking at him with your mouth open. Dummies. Now they work on a plan to try to take this thing out. They found the head of the plant, if you will, but getting to it is going to be difficult. Bert, looks like we stepped in it big time. They come up with a way to basically float over all the other pods and then inject the brains with some chemical concoction that'll kill it. Tyler floats over using a bunch of balloons and he makes it to the main pod. He injects it and after giving it a full dose, it kills them all. Larry takes Cletus back home, but before heading out, he asks him a very important question. You guys in the old lab, you ever do experiments with time travel? Graboid Rights is hands down my least favorite of the series. It's okay, but I don't really like what they did to Mindy's character. They turned her into a Graboid Rights activist. That just makes no sense. She's one of the ones who saw these things firsthand, and now she's trying to protect them? Plus, she was a little girl when it all happened. I would assume she would still be in therapy. To make matters worse, she dropped out of school to join this dude in the cause. So all that work in selling an ass blaster just to drop out? Okay, great. The person behind the movement is Dr. Ellie Bergen, who studies the effect of humans encroaching on Graboid territory, which Bert argues they're coexisting, not encroaching. She believes that just by living near El Blanco, the Perfectionites are killing him. So yeah, Nancy meets Mindy's new boyfriend, Chad, who's a real Chad. Mindy tries to get her mom on her side, but at least she knows better. And we do see that something's up. Most of the activists are just marching around holding signs, but some of them seem to be up to no good. Even going as far as toilet papering Bert's compound, a ballsy move for someone who takes pride in his guns. Bert and Nancy take the doctor's evidence to Casey, who confirms that the data does seem accurate. El Blanco's dying, but Bert's confident. If a Graboid is killed by a couple humans living around it, then it would have been extinct ages ago. Bert takes some samples, and the locals are starting to see it now too. El Blanco isn't acting right. After one of the guys working with Chad is eaten, the group finds a mysterious substance left over, which turns out to be poison. The activist group is actually slowly killing the giant worm. But why? Just then, a very sick El Blanco bursts from the ground, about to die. But the group is able to think quickly and work up an antidote, which Mindy, now seeing the error in her ways, chucks into El Blanco's mouth, saving it. So what happened? Well, Chad is actually in the clear on this one. The poison belongs to Dr. Ellie. She says that she had to prove her point, that humans were harming the Graboid just by living here. So she was slowly poisoning him to make it look true. But she never intended on actually killing him. When El Blanco ate that dude, it got a full dose and just about took him out. After a couple of days, El Blanco's back to normal, and Tyler can resume giving tourists a ride to try to get a sneak peek at him. Mindy goes back to college, and everything's wrapped up in a neat little bow. Water Hazard brings Melvin back into the picture, but this time he's given up on buying out all the perfectionites and moved on to making a world-class golf course. And it turns out that the fountain is broken. So the handyman goes to take a look, and something eats him up. A graboid in the water? No, this is something else. 
In town, everyone is gathered to discuss their water table, which is lowering. And they might be forced to dig the well deeper, but they just don't have the funds. Out of options, Rosalita goes to Melvin for a job, basically giving up. But before she says yes, they find the body of the missing handyman. They call the cops, Rosalita takes a sample back to Casey to study, and she can tell that it's the shell of a crustacean, definitely not a shrieker. Melvin asks Tyler to take a look, and he does, but while out there, the cops show up and stop him. This was the scene of a murder after all. While there, the monster attacks, killing the officers, and Tyler just barely makes it out alive, coming on shore to meet the local sheriff, played by Jim Beaver, another guy you've most likely seen in other shows like Breaking Bad and Supernatural. Yes. It's it. The sheriff locks up Tyler, and in the clink, he learns that Melvin didn't drill his own well for the golf course, but instead stole it from the sleepy town of perfection. Hence why their water table's so low. Anyway, Bert comes and bails out Tyler, and he tries to see what they're up against. And it turns out to be brine shrimp, but this thing was six foot long. Well, that's because they were contaminated with Mixmaster, yeah, still not done with that plot line yet. The good news is that it seems like there's only one, but if it gets out and spreads into the open waters, well, once it dies, others will feed on it, and Mixmaster could contaminate hundreds of species. And that's exactly what it looks like is going to happen. The shrimp only has one little creek between it and the aqueduct. So our heroes work to stop it. Friggin' fantastic! Rosalita donates some fencing, which seems to contain it for now, but what if it turns around and heads back? Well, Twitchell's got that one covered, blocking it with his car. With it now trapped, they call into the local market and order all the dry ice they have and toss it into the water, which I guess freezes the monster. And that's the end of that. The Sounds of Silence is another Mixmaster episode. This time, the animal is my personal biggest fear, cicadas. These last two episodes are also notable because of the absence of Bert. I thought he was in all 13 episodes, but no, he missed out on the last two because he was filming Tremors 4. The dude is so busy with Tremors that he doesn't have time for Tremors. In his place, in this episode at least, is Dr. Donna Debevic, who's kind of set up like a potential love interest for Bert, if the show were to continue. I say that because she's exactly like him. Oh, you maybe stick around till Bert gets back. You just might hit it off. Yeah, I caught a 60 Minutes interview. What a stiff. She studies animal sounds and has taken an interest in, you guessed it, El Blanco. But there's something else making noise here and it's loud. In town, we see that Larry's back, and causing trouble like always. He's still a graboid nerd, and now he's here to stay. That's right, Larry moved out of his parents' basement and into perfection, sleeping on Nancy's couch. I will say he has good taste in movies, though. We've got Theater of Blood, House on Haunted Hill, Tales of Terror, and The Fly, which is a great DVD. Well, at first, everyone in town thinks that there's another graboid out there making all the noise. But Rosalita soon figures out, no, it's bugs. Lots and lots of them. Also, to make matters worse, they're paving the only road in and out of perfection. They're stuck here to fix this problem for themselves. Rosalita comes by to tell them how she narrowly escaped with her life and her hearing because the bugs are so loud. They also figure out that it eats wood. So this time, Mixmaster combined with cicadas and termite DNA. Great. At least they're not giant like the shrimp. Well, as the story progresses, the insects get hungry, and wood isn't enough. They've moved on to animals and humans. Worse yet, they have the ability to basically paralyze people with their sounds. The group comes up with a plan to use the bug's mating call to attract them all to one place, and then they could take them out. 
The distraction works just in time, too, because the bugs were about to take over Jody's store. The group discuss their options and where they should lead the bugs, and they end up taking them to the unfinished paved road to trap them in tar, douse them in gasoline, and burn every last one of the bugs. The final episode is the key, and gives us some closure on old Frankie the mobster. Remember him? He's working with Dolores, who I think is his old partner Max's widow. She assumes that because a graboid is so big, it must have a lot of guts. Therefore, if El Blanco ate someone, say Max, then it would take months for him to pass. Seeing how Max had the key on him, they still might have a way to get their $20 million after all. They team up with Helmut Kraus, an inventor who has a sound cannon, which is able to stun El Blanco so they can cut it open. Right from the get-go, you can tell Dolores is conning these men, using them to get what she wants, and when she's done with them, she'll off them. Meanwhile, there's a subplot with Larry trying to find a new mysterious monster. He might be onto something. With how Mixmaster's been working in the valley, you never know what you might get. And here, we never get a good look at it. So he names it Invisibat. Later on, Dolores comes into town for the Graboid tour, and Tyler shows her to all the hot spots, including the old abandoned Jessup place. Later that night, Larry wanders into Jody's store to get a better look at what he captured on his camera. And inside, he gets a surprise. Frankie's hiding out. Frank locks Larry in the freezer, and in the morning, Jody lets him out. And he explains what happened. So now everyone knows Frankie's back. The next day, the trio's out looking for El Blanco, and they find him. Dolores uses helmet as bait so Frankie can shoot the graboid with the sound cannon. And as cruel as it is, their plan works. But before they can start cutting, Tyler and Rosalita show up so they have to hide and wait. Tyler calls in Twitchell, who comes to look at the confused worm. What's up with a siren, Twitch? We're in the middle of the desert. I just always wanted to use it, all right? A local vet takes a look at El Blanco and thinks maybe he had a stroke, but he needs proper working facilities to do a scan. So they load it up in the back of Tyler's truck and take him into town. At first, the criminals think this is bad, but really, our heroes are just making it easy for them. Now they can steal the truck and do whatever they want with the monster. They take it to the abandoned Jessup place, where Larry's hiding out looking for his creature. Here, the bad guys get ready to cut it up. But why should Frankie do all the dirty work when he's got Tyler right here? He gives him the chainsaw and tells him to start cutting. But what Frankie doesn't see is Larry's working on getting the sound cannon. Tyler makes some noise so Larry can get the gun, and once he does, he aims. But then, Invisibat attacks, and he misses his mark. That's okay, he still stopped the bad guys, and Tyler's in control now. There's a stare off, the Invisibat strikes again and wakes up El Blanco, who eats Dolores, and Frankie gets away. But that's okay. He doesn't get too far. The guy who picks him up just so happens to be a fellow mobster who isn't happy that he lost the ever important key. What happened to it? Is it still being digested by El Blanco? Well, it turns out he already passed it and Larry finds it in the middle of the desert, unaware of its worth. It does sort of get to the point where I'm like, just leave perfection already. I get that it's your home, but if I had giant underground worms and heat-seeking monsters and acid-spitting plants and a giant bacteria monster that wanted to suck me dry, I think I'd just leave. But that was the Tremors TV series. It really wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. But like anything else, there was a lot of drama and studio high-ups making dumb decisions. One of which was some bozo decided to air the episodes out of order. So if you were watching them on TV, you'd be all confused. Not every episode rolls into the next, but some plot points do carry over. 
so it's best to find the correct viewing order online and follow that. The order in which I recapped them is the proper order. Another disappointment is the lack of returning characters. For the most part, the entire series takes place in perfection, right after the third movie, so I would expect to see all of the citizens there. And yeah, they're here, but in name only. There's only two characters that returned from the movies to do the show. Bert and Melvin. That's it! Nancy, Jody, Mindy, they're all played by different actors. Now, I understand there's scheduling conflicts and contracts with other projects, but still, it's a bummer. It's funny though, I actually think I prefer Nancy from the TV series more than the movies, but that's just personal preference, I guess. Whoever it is that got Christopher Lloyd on the show, however, you, sir, deserve a handshake. As you can see, Michael Gross is the face of the Tremors series, but behind the scenes, the guy who put his heart and soul into these movies is no doubt S.S. Wilson. In my research for this show, I found a QA on Stampede Entertainment's website that is so well done. Seriously, just any question you would ever have about this show has been asked here and answered by S.S. Wilson himself. The guy really cares about this series and it's a shame we didn't get a second, third, or fourth season. Back in 2017, Tremors fans like myself got super excited when we found out Kevin Bacon was on board for a pilot for another Tremors TV show. Think about that for a second. But then our hopes were squashed when he announced the sci-fi decided to not move forward with the project. So everyone boo the man that decided that. So in the end, do I recommend the Tremors TV show? Well, it's only for hardcore Tremors fans. Personally, I enjoyed it, but my wife watched some episodes with me and she thought it was silly and dumb. And she has a point. The CGI, some of the plot points are stupid, but the show was fun and that's all I could really ask for. I give it two and a half Cletus Poffenburgers out of four. How'd you find me? I stuck a small tracking device on your bumper about six months ago. <laughs> Just kidding. So you parked out in front.